Good morning, good morning. Okay, we've, uh, we've come now to the third Sunday in Advent, uh, thinking together about the incarnation of Jesus through the eyes of Isaiah. These uh, four prophetic snapshots of the servant of the Lord and what that means to us. Hopefully, uh, just as it was for Simeon, in the temple holding the infant Jesus and saying, my eyes have seen the salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Maybe so, Lord. You know, it's a miracle that any of us see and understand. I want to say thank you to the <clears throat> priest family um, for lighting the Advent candle, each of one of the candles serving as uh, um, theological cues, uh, helping us trace the story uh, of Jesus' coming. Uh, the third candle, the pink candle, is tip traditionally called the shepherd's candle of joy. And of course, nothing characterizes uh, the first Christmas morning, uh, then this sense of unbridled joy, right? Gladness and peace. So how's that working out for you? Come on, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? <laughs> With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer, right? Really? Uh, besides a terrible singing voice, uh, that might not uh, that might not be the sentiment as they open the doors of Targets and Walmarts and city after city, with people trampling over one another. Hey, can I get some help over here? This is the wrong size, out of, out of stock, late shipping, but it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? And then there's the buckets full of family dynamics. I mean, Betsy and I, we're preparing to have all four of our adult children, uh, two spouses, two grandchildren, five dogs, and the grandmother who refuses to come. I couldn't even set up correctly uh, the, the app Elf, where the, the, you draw or you're assigned a secret sin, I couldn't even set it up right. And now everyone is frustrated. All this drama and dysfunction seems to come nearer to us than at other times. Anxiety, disappointment, just weary. And if for no other reasons, it's, it's been a long year. And a lot has happened in our lives and in the world. But it's the hap, hap, happiest time of the year with those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings. There'll be much mistletoeing and hearts will be glowing. Right? The calendar is so marked up you can't even read it. Right? parties and the performances, the sitters and situations, and the glitches when people and packages arrive broken. So are you having fun yet? Or is your Advent experience characterized more by weariness than wonder? The Lord God knows, and his servant sings a different song for you in Isaiah chapter 50. So if you would, please uh, stand and let's give our attention to the reading of the third servant song from Isaiah 50, beginning in, chap uh, in verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I might know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens 
He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled, this you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Father, would you open eyes that we might see your servant, Jesus, as bigger and more believable than ever before, and to open our ears that we might hear the word of reassurance he brings as we turn to trust in him again and again. May we find greater wonder than weariness to robustly celebrate your servant's coming and long for his return and offer to others what you have offered us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Weariness. That's often a problem with the Lord's people. It's not that we are always just blown away as just worn out. And, and so it is for these to whom Isaiah writes, who will find themselves in Babylonian captivity, weary, exhausted, delirious to the point that they were arguing with God. And you find that actually for 39 or more chapters in Isaiah. Isn't that usually when we do our worst arguing when we're weary, they were imagining, they were arguing that God had forgotten them. He cast them aside. He turned away, finished with them. God's people were weary. But as we saw in the first two servant songs, God's plan is to regather his people. And in the words of Tucker Fleming, I think he was, cutting, he was quoting someone else to make all the bad things right. You recall how the first song began? Behold my servant. Meaning, as our pastor Scott Phillips said, y'all come, you gotta see this. Right? In these servant songs, now Isaiah is imagining a figure. He sees into the future the Lord's beautiful servant to come. And last week we learned his name, Emmanuel, God with us. How then would Israel respond? Well, look at one chapter earlier, chapter 49, verse 14. The Lord has forsaken me. He's forgotten me, as if to say we may never hear music and mercy again. Even the believing remnant of God's people, they were weary. They were stuck. You ever experienced anything like that? God's 
God answers their complaint in the next verse, verse 15. What? Can, can a woman forget her nursing child? Look, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand, verse 16. Divorce you? Chapter 50, verse 1. No way. So why? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Chapter 50, verse 2. This is what weariness does to them and does to us. But now here, one word of despondency that we read in verse 14 now sets off as my former seminary professor, Dr. Ralph Davis notes here, <clears throat> this word of despondency now sets off almost four chapters of overwhelming reassurance from the God of all comfort to his anxious and exhausted people. In all this, the servant himself now speaks. First person here, center stage, verses four through nine. And verses 10 and 11 serving as footnotes, but actually getting to the heart of the matter. So we want to hear, we want to see these word pictures of the servant, how he is suited for us in our weariness. The first being a skill, the servant skilled in God's word. In verse 4 there. How the servant is, as Isaiah foresaw in chapter 9, a wonderful counselor to us. Look at verse 4. You see there, he, he's been given a disciple's tongue, an instructed tongue, as one who's been taught by Yahweh himself. And so the servant is able to bring a skilled word, a timely word to God's people. The word, a word of truth and wisdom and comfort to counsel the weary. <clears throat> now, you and I might think of better things that the weary need. Perhaps a few nights rest or a five-hour energy drink or a lottery ticket. But no. The servant assumes the need of a word and that that word will support you. Now, some of you know that experience. As we read in the Psalms, the word of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. To borrow an illustration, maybe you've read this in a book or maybe seen it in a, a movie or a docu-series, the, the weary soldier on the battlefield, and he's sitting there behind a tree or in a foxhole, and he's pouring over letters from home. Night after night, by firelight or flashlight, hanging on to every word, he can go days without food, according to one historian. A word does support. It does sustain, and you can live on the words of a loved one. And this is what the servant is able to do, to bring a skilled word and a, a necessary word, but also a fresh word for fresh needs. Morning by morning, awakened, Awakened in the presence of the Father. Not always the way I would describe the way I get up in the morning. But this is the servant's rhythm. Yahweh awakens my ear. This constant communion in the Lord and with the Lord. Saying to his Father, as it were, what are you going to teach me? What are you going to tell me that I might bring it to your people? That I might support your weary people? Is this not what we read in the Gospels? What is most noticeable about Jesus? 
It's the way he spoke in an entirely different way. Nothing stale. Words so gracious. Gospel words, healing words, helping words. The way he speaks, it seems to meet us precisely where we are, as, as though he can read our hearts and minds and bring a fresh word to us in that weary place, that sore spot, that place of confusion, that shameful secret, right at the place of our need. What do you do with someone what do you do with someone who's overcome with a sense of weariness? Pull yourself together, man. <clears throat> they can't pull themselves together. What, what can you say to possibly cut through the darkness of despair? Jesus, the perfect disciple, knows the exact word, the necessary word the fresh word to speak. And he says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I got a word for you. I will give you rest. And this is what the servant, this is what the servant's word does in our weariness, even our sins and our circumstances that weigh down on us. He is able to reach in and put his word right at that place of our need. Have you experienced that? You, you read something or you listen uh, to the word of God taught or preached, or maybe you're driving down the road listening to a, a podcast, and the word comes to you with such profundity and relevance what no one else in the world could possibly give to you because no one knows exactly where you are and what you need. But the servant of the Lord does. And the word demonstrates this power to lift you up. Do you know that experience? Has your ear been opened? The prophetic vision here is is not only of a servant as a perfect disciple of Yahweh, but also that in him and with him, you too might become a disciple as one who is taught, as one skilled to counsel others with a word in the midst of their weariness. And so we're being told, we're seeing how it is that the incarnate servant would become a wonderful counselor to his people. But secondly, we see the servant submissive to God's will. We see that in verses 5 and 6 of our, our text. The, the Lord God has opened my ear, verse 5. That actually is an, an expression of being made submissive as servants would have been in ancient days. Uh, the, uh, the practice of being made a servant permanently is prescribed in Exodus chapter 21. Bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear, and he shall serve him permanently. And in this case, with this servant, painfully, I did not rebel. I did not turn away, he says. I gave myself to abuse, verse 6, as a punching bag. I did not hide from mockery, from scorn and spit. A sufferer submissive to God's will. That's the picture here. Now, Pastor Scott will go into much more detail next Sunday as we look at the fourth servant song from Isaiah 53. But it's, but it's worth reflecting on this morning how, one, the servant's suffering was Yahweh, God, the Lord God's will 
his father's will. He has opened my ear. This is what he wants me to do. And secondly, the, the servant was submissive to the, ser, to the suffering that he was called to. I did not rebel. And third, the suffering is shameful and intense. And Now, here, though, there's, there's no explanation as to why. We're not given all the details here, but it becomes clear to us that here in our text is a forecast of Jesus' suffering. So it's no mistake then at the top of the stark Christmas tree where most might would place a star or an angel. We've chosen to place a cross. The incarnate Christ is the suffering servant born to die identified by John the Baptist saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The New Testament Gospels provide us, they provide all the gory details, but let's ask this. What, what might this have meant to Israel in captivity to see this picture of the servant of the Lord suffering? Well, at least this, that God's servant was not only a minister to the weary and to the suffering, but that he himself was wearied and suffered. No weary one could ever say that this servant speaks from some lofty detachment. No. No. Far from it. No one has felt no one has felt the struggle more intensely or paid a bigger price for obedience. He has fully entered in. And isn't that experience? Isn't that what adds such weight to his ministry of the word that we read about in verse four? Let me illustrate. As a new Christian throwing my first real pity party. Yes. Freshman in college. Experiencing the first pushback about my faith from my family and friends. And experiencing for the first time the pain of losing some things, some dreams that I held dear. And it wasn't about that time that I had the opportunity to see Johnny Erickson wheeled out on a stage and speak about the sovereignty of God. And so the servant's suffering too adds weight to his word when speaking a word to the weary and to the suffering especially to those believers in verse 10, right? Who, who walk in darkness and have no light. You know, verse 10 is not actually a part of the servant's song, but it becomes important when you see, when you read here in verse 10, the fear of the Lord and obey the verse voice of the servant are said in the same breath. I mean, we read, uh, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of the servant and is not there? The fear of the Lord, obey the voice of his servant. When you hear that said like that in the same breath, placed as it were on the same level of equivalency, the servant you see, begins, you begin to see that the servant has a certain sovereignty about him. He has a certain right to command, obey the voice of the servant. And you see, you see where this is going. The servant is no mere man. He's deity. 
Yahweh, the great I am incarnate. God himself, you see the implication here? God himself knows your darkness, your weariness and suffering. He knows it up close and personal because he's entered in. The prophetic, the prophetic vision here is of this servant, obedient in and through weakness and suffering. According to God's will. It's no accident. That's the vision, but also that you too, that you and I might obey and do the same. So, so what do you do in your weariness and suffering? You, you wait on him, yes, knowing that the servant has already walked through all of that. He knows the way through the darkness. And he has come out on the other end, victorious, whole, healed, helped, and without a tinge of resentment in his soul. That's Jesus. And that then becomes the final picture here of the servant. Verses 7 through 9. The servant certain of God's help. Or we might say, we could say, the believer's certainty of God's help. For despite suffering, the servant goes on believing. He becomes a model for God's people in captivity, for sure. But also our hope in him, in him, with him. The believer's certainty of God's help. You see here, but the Lord God helps me. It's repeated twice for emphasis in verse 7 and in verse 9. This is the very core of the servant's faith. The sovereign Lord at his side, as his advocate. And notice the effects of his faith. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I will set my face like flint. Now, where else have we heard that expression, set my face like flint? Well, we see it in the New Testament. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, which is the whole hinge verse of the Gospel of Luke as Jesus turns in his earthly ministry to head toward Jerusalem and to the cross and where his cross and resurrection, he will find vindication. Now, you know this thing about Flint, right? You know that Flint is this, I'm not a Boy Scout, but I understand it's, 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 this hard, it's hard rock. It's this hard piece of rock, and it's been used forever, for ages. But in the ancient times, and maybe still today, it's, flint can be used to, to form a tool, like a drill, or, or form a weapon, like an arrowhead, or, or the tip of a spear. And so, in this expression, set my face like flint, would you and I not read into that this almost hint, sense of defiance, a defiant faith, a sharp faith, a focused faith, a triumphant faith. It, it's almost as if a challenge here in this, this uh series of, of uh, this litany of questions that we find here in verses 8 and 9. And uh, it, it seems to support this idea of this defiant, triumph, challenging faith. Like, my justifier, he says, is close by. Who dares bring a charge against me? Let us stand up in court together. Bring it on. 
Who is the one who dares to declare me guilty? Surely all of them will crumble like a moth-ravaged garment. That's what he says. You know, sometimes, uh, as a number of the commentaries that I consulted, sometimes questions are, are not an expression of doubt, but absolute certainty. Actually, an affirmation and a confirmation. Like my, I have a friend. I have this friend who frequently responds to the obvious, saying, you think? That's a question. You think? The obvious being yes and yes. Doesn't, by the way, this now call to mind another passage another series, another litany of rapid-fire questions meant to almost challenge, almost overwhelm you. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 35. You know that famous, who, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave, us, uh, gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him? Give us freely, give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Remember, Paul says, it is God who justifies. But maybe, maybe as Donald Gray Barnhouse suggests, that's not a statement. It's a question. That's another question. In fact, maybe that whole passage, you, you might turn to it right now so that you could see what I'm talking about. In Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 31 to 35. So, uh, Dr. Bornhouse suggests you know, all of that are, are just a litany of rapid-fire questions. Who shall bring a, a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, God who justifies? Question mark. Is that not absurd? Who is the one condemning? Question mark. Christ Jesus who died? Question mark. Who, who, yes, who was raised? Question mark. Who is at the right hand of God? Question mark. This litany, who intercedes for us? Question mark. This litany of rapid fired questions almost to create the effect, the overwhelming defiant effect that is that not ludicrous? that such a Savior would condemn us when he has done all this for us? It, it's almost as if it, this Romans 8 passage, uh, it, like the servant, there is this, this defiant certainty of God's help. Paul is suggesting, given all that has been done, Yes and yes. Is there anything that could peel you loose from the superglue of God's love in Christ Jesus? No and no. And that's the final picture here. The way of the servant triumphing even if through weariness and suffering there's a kind of defiant, steadfast faith because he, he is the one upon whom the might of God is going to come. The sovereign Lord God helps me, comes alongside me, advocates, defends, vindicates. And the prophetic, the prophetic vision here is not only the servant experiencing the help of God, but also that in him and with him, you and I are to experience the same. And yet, even when God's people have heard this song, and seeing this amazing picture, a servant's word and a servant's submission, 
and a servant's certainty of help. Even then, which by the way, on this side of the incarnation is fulfilled in Jesus. Even then, when God's people have seen all this, Isaiah is still not, he's still not yet taken us to the heart of the matter. Verses 10 and 11, the heart of the matter. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches. Yeah, walk by the light of that fire and by the torches that you yourself have kindled. This you have from my hand, you will lie down in torment. The heart of the matter here in 10 and 11 is the matter of the heart. In verse 10, calling out to believing Israel. In verse 11, warning the unbelieving and the rebellious. There are always two Israels, always have been. The believing remnant and the rebellious. There are always two kinds of people in the world. And there are always two kinds of people in this sanctuary this morning. Why, says the Lord, why when I called, there was no one to answer. May this not be said of you, nor of me. And only because there is one here, there is one who has answered for us, counsels us, suffers for us, triumphs for us, and we trust him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, first of all, we're so grateful that you have preserved your word and uh, open it up to us by your Holy Spirit. You clarify. But honestly, Lord, we, uh, we don't always trust. So thank you for using this passage now uh, to call us to faith, to encourage us, to support us who are weary and suffering, to bring a word in that place. Uh, so we give you thanks and praise. Yes, Lord, may, uh, may we hear the song. May we hear your call. And may we uh, turn and trust in the name of the Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.